Good morning. Forgot to unmute myself. Can you all hear me? Yes, we can. All right. Good morning again. Um, welcome to the United Church of Christ of Annapolis worship service. I'm Kathy McFadden. I'm the moderator. I hope you're all doing the best you can during this trying times and keeping a positive spirit. Please recognize that your mental health is just as important as your physical health, especially during this time. I have many announcements uh, this morning. Uh, we are a busy church. Um, every Sunday before church, join the Bible study from 9.05 via Zoom online, gathering um, living questions. Coffee hour. If you haven't joined us, it is really amazing to watch everybody come online and we all get together and then we break out into different Zoom classes or Zoom um, meetings and then we come back together, bring a cup of coffee, whatever you can right after um, the service and please join us. It, it really gets us all back together and, and as virtually as we can. Um, also tonight at six o'clock, uh, join the Evolve Create, uh, Evolve Creation Spiritual Sacred Gathering. Pastor will be um, trying to preach outside today if the weather holds up, which I think it will. It's absolutely beautiful out. And he was just reporting that our gardens are great. They look beautiful. So if you get a chance, um, join virtually. The link is in our um, What's Happening. Um, <clears throat> strengthening Congregation and Racial Equality. Joan Brannigan, who is our missions uh, chair, attended an ACT meeting on Wednesday. It is important that you take time and read in what's happening at UCCA Annapolis on all the topics that were addressed during this meeting. Um, online gatherings this week, Living the Question, the adult study group, uh, the Living the Question has switched from to every other Thursday morning at 1030 for a new study, Allegiance of the Empire, to study how we can be citizens of a God, peaceful kingdom, peaceful bullet kingdom in our time. The Living the Question, July the 16th, and also July the 30th. Children's Bible study, um, as we do every week, it's on demand. If you want to uh, like to have your ch child speak with pastor, please email him at pastor at uccaannapolis.org and he'll find the time to work with you. Uh, pastor's um, office hours this week um, are from 10 to 11 on Tuesday morning. So give him a call. Uh, we also have our social hour, join us and connect with friends and neighbors uh, on a weekly social hour in Zoom. <clears throat> a very important um, meeting or virtual meeting will be coming up on Thursday, and this is part of ACT, and it's Power and Race. It'll be Thursday on July the 16th from 7 to 8.30 p.m., and you can go online and register. This is a very important topic to me. Um, I've been involved in this type of um, initiatives since the early 90s. And the what is so important to me about this, and especially what's going on with ACT, is it's not giving lip service. We are actually making a difference. ACT, everything ACT does is just amazing how we can make a difference bringing all these churches together. It is, it is truly um, a, a journey. And we need to all work together on multiracial um, issues. And I know that when we put our heads together and we put our hearts and our minds, we can make a difference. So if you get an opportunity on Thursday, please join in. This is, and you'll hear more about this from pastor, but it will be um, something I think that everyone should be participating in. Our church is so active and we are making a difference. Thank you and please have a great week. And remember to keep checking in with everybody and see how your neighbors are doing, your church people are doing, and just all around the globe, um, your connections. It's really important we keep connected. Thank you. The grace and peace of Christ be with you. And also with you. My name is Chris Wilson, and it is a joy to worship with you today. The service order has been posted on Facebook and emailed out, so please feel free to download it and let us now join together in our call to worship. Your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. When I am severely afflicted, you give me life. You set down for me your ordinances, ways to live and love for fullness of life. When I follow them, I feel a fullness of life a wholeheartedness of love. 
Accept my offerings of praise and never stop teaching me your ways. Open my eyes. That I may see my sisters and brothers and you in them. Open my ears. That I may listen. And my lips. So my mouth may proclaim your praise. Peace be with you. And also with you. Please feel free to share a sign of peace with anyone among you by sending a text to someone or just shout peace to the world. Peace. God, send your spirit among us, a spirit so broad, so vast that it enfolds and encompasses each of us. 
Though some may feel they do not deserve this spirit of love, remind us that you send it to us regardless. So God, whenever and wherever each one of us is, send your spirit, gather us in, draw us forth from fear, so that our mouths may open in wonder and sing out praise. Give us hope that fear will not contain us and let us listen to the sounds of all the earth. This we pray as your people in the name of Jesus, one of us, amen. People of God, trusting in God's forgiveness, let us in silence confess our failings and acknowledge our part in the pain of the world. Before God, with the people of God, I confess to turning away from God in the ways I wound my life, the lives of others, and the life of the world. May God forgive you, Christ renew you, and the Spirit enable you to grow in love. Amen. Before God, with the people of God, we confess to turning away from God in the ways we wound our lives, the lives of others, and the life of the world. May God forgive you, Christ renew you, and the Spirit enable you to grow in love. Amen. Amen. Good morning. So today we're telling the story of how a younger brother got something that the older brother had. And it's a hard story to hear because I'm an older brother. I've got three younger siblings. They might even be watching this now. And one of those has always been, we've well, been a little bit competitive, my, my younger brother. And there's always been this kind of you know, sibling rivalry, and I'm sure you might have heard of it. Uh, maybe. I don't know. Um, but we had this, this kind of a sibling rivalry thing going on, and the story today that that's, we're going to share in the, from the Bible is in the book of Genesis, and it's about Esau and Jacob, and they were twins, but not the kind of twins that match each other. They were fraternal twins, and Esau was very different from his younger brother. Esau was rugged and powerful and strong-looking, just like, you know, older brothers are. And, and Jacob was, was smooth and, and nice and, and liked being indoors. Um, yeah, bad stereotypes. Don't use those. Um, and so yeah, I had a younger brother, not a twin brother. But as an older brother, I often tried to kind of make him do what I wanted him to do or find ways to kind of give him the different things. We used to share a bedroom, for example, and one of the tricks that I used to play was you know, we would be told to clean up the room, and so we would make the room in half. Well, somehow his half was always bigger than my half. Um, my mother figured this out very quickly, and thus, you know, wouldn't let any of us out of the room until the whole room was clean, and so it didn't work in my favor to try to say, my half is clean and his isn't. But that was a way that we used to try to divide things up. But what I learned over time was that it was far more fun to not try to cheat my little brother out of things. Um, trying to cheat in a game was a false victory. It didn't really make any sense. And sometimes we'd spend lots of time with each other and we'd have to come up with ways to make this actually work. And so what I started doing instead over time was rather than trying to cheat my younger brother out of participating in things, I tried to come up with ways to do it. For example, I color-coded the game of Clue. I wish I knew how I did it. Um, because he couldn't read, but I figured out how to color code the game of Clue in a way that, yeah, you think it's already color coded. Oh, no, it still requires reading. We figured out how to color code it so that we could participate. Part of what the Bible story is pointing us to is that often we think that we have to be in competition in order to earn God's love or our parents' love or our friends. We think that we have to compete with one another to make that happen. But while this story kind of points us in a direction, a few years later, 
the brothers will reconcile. You see, at the end of the story, they're going to be mad at each other, and they're not going to be happy with each other because one has cheated the other out of what they wanted. But at the end of the story, at the end of it, they figure out how to reconcile, and they figure out how to be people together. And I think that's a far more important gift. And I know that we've all probably spent a lot of time with one another, a lot of time with one another, um, in the past couple of months. So maybe we might not want to share, but I think that's part of what what we're being asked by God to do now is how can we come up with ways to share what we've got? How can we come up with ways to include people into it? How can we stretch um, our, our friendliness, our niceness, just a little bit more so that everybody can come in? And I think that's a real challenge for us. And I think it's a real challenge that we're given. But I think it's a really important one is to find out how we can be nicer, more inclusive, more inviting, so that we all get a piece of this, because as God has reminded us over and over and over and over again, there is enough. There is enough. And we have a way to be able to share that. And if we learn how to work together, we're going to be a lot happier sharing it. So I hope we figure that out from today's story. Let us pray. Loving God, help us to learn to share, to include, to invite, to invite our parents, to invite our friends, if we can, to invite our family, to participate in the life that we live. Help us to not try to cut people out. And in so doing, may we share and love better. And so let us pray the prayer which Jesus taught us, saying, Our Father, Mother, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us of our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. celebrate myself and sing myself and what I assume you shall assume for every atom belonging to me as good belongs to you I loaf and invite my soul I lean and loaf at my ease observing a sphere of summer grass my tongue every atom of my blood formed from this soil this air born here of parents born here from parents the same, and their parents the same. I, now 37 years old, in perfect health begin, hoping to cease not till death. Creeds and schools in abeyance, retiring back a while, suffice at what they are, but never forgotten. I harbor for good or bad. I permit to speak at every hazard. Nature without check, with original energy. I chose to memorize and recite uh, the first verse of Walt Whitman's song myself for a literature class in high school when 37 years old seemed old. Exactly why I chose the, pro the poem, I'm not entirely sure, but I would imagine that to the ears of a 16 or 17 year old, these words spoke of a passion for life that I shared, a love of nature and, and an interwoven humanity, a fluid sexuality that felt scandalous in the, night, the late 1990s and how much more so in the uh, 19th century. I didn't understand everything then, and even now I trip over some of the meanings behind his words. 
I knew Whitman spoke the truth as he felt it. This was his perspective as he contemplated his life and the leaves of grass. This was his song of himself, yet he says to the reader that every atom belonging to me as good belongs to you. Through time, I, nearing 40, also hold this to be true. It is my birthright into creation that every atom belonging to me as good belongs to you. My joy and wonder at this earth was created by the earth that created me. I wonder at the earth because I am made from the stuff of the earth. This is my birthright. Since creation, I am inevitable, inevitable in this moment. Each second, I am changed. The air, the water, the land. These... <laughs> Hold on, babe. I'll be there in a second. Movies. One moment, life has interrupted. Go to here. Such is life now. The air, the water, the land, all of this, these are part of my birthright to steward as I steward the cells of my body, to be given over in time back to the earth and passed on to something or someone new. The never forgotten creeds and schools are my birthright too. All the knowledge, the science, the philosophy, the world of religion, all that has been created by humanity this is all my birthright, mine to harbor for good or bad. When I first started thinking about birthright, this poem popped into my head, along with the stories of Jacob and Esau, a birthright traded for soup, of Moses, a birthright unknown until he became an adult, of Jesus and God, a birthright reimagined and everlasting. And we, the bearers of the image of God, an inherent birthright. I was not born into a church-going nuclear family, even though our extended family was filled with ministers, preachers, deacons, choir directors, and religious churchgoers. I don't remember ever going to church, ever, as a family. Looking back on our small town, I couldn't tell you which church we would have gone to as a mixed race and very complex family. My sisters and I did, however, go to vacation Bible school every summer. And from the age of three to six, I attended a church preschool. Once I learned how to read, I often read a book of children's Bible stories. I have harbored these stories since then. I've studied, debated, loved, and loathed, unlearned, and relearned these stories over and over again. They are my birthright. To know and grapple with. How else would I have understood Western culture and literature without understanding the Bible? I wonder if I uh, heard as a child the psalmist um, saying, One second. I wonder if I heard as a child the psalmist say, your decrees are my heritage forever. They are the joy of my heart. I incline my heart to perform your statutes forever to the end. How would I have known those statutes if I did not study them? I'm thankful for my teachers and professors. I'm thankful for my family and for the church that encourages an ongoing study and grappling with the texts. And I'm thankful that we have decided to teach the stories of the Bible to our son from an early age so that he learns this part of his birthright, his foundation for understanding the world as it is, the history of the Western world, the richness of literature, 
relationships, and God. Now, these are not light subjects to teach a child, but they are his to harbor for good or bad, allowing him to speak at every hazard with authority, giving him an understanding of the true power and energy inherent in nature. That is his power, his energy, and his birthright, his heritage forever. And I hope the joy of his heart as it is mine. Thank you, church. Love you all and miss you all. Listen now in the reading of scripture for the word and wisdom of God. We open our hearts to the word and wisdom of God. From Genesis 25, 19 through 34, the message translation. This is the family tree of Isaac, son of Abraham. Abraham had Isaac. Isaac was 40 years old when he married Rebekah, daughter of Bethuel, the Aramean of Paddan Aram. She was the sister of Laban, the Aramean. Isaac prayed hard to God for his wife because she was barren. God answered his prayer and Rebekah became pregnant. But the children tumbled and kicked inside of her so much that she said, if this is the way it's going to be, why go on living? She went to God to find out what was going on. And God told her, two nations are in your womb, two peoples butting heads while still in your body. One people will overpower the other and the older will serve the younger. When her time to give birth came, sure enough, there were twins in her womb. The first came out reddish as if snugly wrapped in a hairy blanket. They named him Esau, Harry. His brother followed his fist clutched tightly to Esau's heel. They named him Jacob, heel. Isaac was 60 years old when they were born. The boys grew up. Esau became an expert hunter, an outdoorsman. Jacob was a quiet man, preferring the life indoors among the tents. Isaac loved Esau because he loved his game, but Rebekah loved Jacob. One day Jacob was cooking a stew. Esau came in from the field starved. Esau said to Jacob, give me some of that red stew, I'm starved. And that's how he came to be called Edom, red. Jacob said, make me a trade, my stew for your rights as firstborn. Esau said, well, I'm starving, what good is a birthright if I'm dead? Jacob said, first swear to me. And he did it. An oath Esau traded away his rights as the firstborn. Jacob gave him bread and the stew of lentils. He ate and drank, got up and left. And that is how Esau shrugged off his rights as the firstborn. So ends the reading. The Gospel according to St. Matthew, chapter 13, verses 1 through 9, and then also verses 18 through 23. At about that t same time, Jesus left the house and sat on the beach. In no time at all, a crowd gathered along the shoreline, forcing him to get into a boat. Using the boat as a pulpit, he addressed his congregation, telling stories. What do you make of this? A farmer planted seed. As he scattered the seed, some of it fell on the road, and birds ate it. Some fell on the gravel. It sprouted quickly, but didn't put down roots. So when the sun came up, it withered just as quickly. Some fell in the weeds. As it came up, it was strangled by the weeds. Some fell on good earth and produced a harvest beyond his wildest dreams. Are you listening to this? Really listening? Study the story of the farmer planting seed. When anyone hears news of the kingdom and doesn't take it in, it just remains on the surface. And so the evil one comes along and plucks it right out of that person's heart. This is the seed the farmer scatters on the road. The seed cast in the gravel, this is the person who hears and instantly responds with enthusiasm. But there is no soil of character, and so when the emotions wear off and some difficulty arrives, there is nothing to show for it. The seed cast in the weeds is the person who hears the kingdom news, but weeds of worry and illusions about getting more and wanting everything under the sun strangle what was heard. And nothing comes of it. The seed cast on good earth is the person who hears and takes in the news and then produces a har harvest beyond his wildest dreams. 
for the word of God in Scripture, for the word of God among us, for the word of God within us. Thanks be to God. Please pray with me. O God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be with us, God, and be beautiful in your sight. O God, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Two nations were in Rebecca's womb. An angel of God told her the first one would grow up to serve the second one. This she knew as they were born. The eldest, Esau, rugged, hairy, red, growing up to be a self-reliant loner who was tough, a hunter, manly, his father's favorite, the ability to bring in the game. The youngest, by just a few seconds, Jacob, coming into the world, clinging to Esau's heel, named for that very moment of clinging onto a heel, smooth-skinned, staying in the camp, running things, his mother's favorite. My brother and his wife have recently had twins, Allison and Violet. We do a video call every week, and every week we are challenged to guess which one is which. They hold them up in front of the screen, and... Most of the time, we get it wrong. I get it wrong, at any rate. Um, you know, last time I saw them in person, they were you know, a couple weeks old. They're now six months. It's good news. But um, they're tough to tell apart. I'm just going to say it, at least for me. But for somebody who's living with them on a regular basis, they know them right off the bat. But for Esau and Jacob, there is a clear difference. And it's not just in appearance. Esau, as we said, is rugged. The firstborn child, he is set to inherit the birthright of his nation, the third in line to receive God's promise given to Abraham and passed down to Isaac. It is a promise of a great nation with descendants more numerous than the stars and of the sky or grains of sand in the desert. 
It is a nation whose story is told thousands of years later, constantly a memory claimed by our religion, the largest religion in the world. The story continues to be told. That is the nation that is his birthright. And Jacob coveted it. His brother was brash. He seemed careless, seemingly reckless. Rather than stay in caring for the flocks and the administration of of the family business, he's out there doing what he wants. He's hunting. He's out in the wild. He's on his own. He's self-sufficient. He's doing what he needs to do. Meanwhile, Jacob's sitting there in the camps, running the family business, figuring out how to grow it. What relationships do we need to have? How do we make this business grow? How do we keep this thing going? It's two very different people. And I think that Esau, like anybody who desires that self-sufficiency, he didn't want anything, he didn't want to be dependent upon anything. He prided the ability to be on his own. He prided the ability to stand on his own two feet. And he had that look, at least the scripture seems to convey it, this look of capability, as if he could do anything, this red hair, this hunter, he could fuse that manliness, that strength, that ability to get things done. It was the sort of thing we might want, right, in a leader. Something we might want in a nation. But as he came into the tent one day, he demanded a bowl of pottage, of stew, of red stuff, lentils, from his brother. And his brother asks him for his birthright in exchange. An entire nation for a bowl of soup. And Esau says, what use is a birthright if I die of hunger? Perhaps it was a bad day for hunting. Who knows? He takes the bowl, and the birthright is shrugged away, despised, transferred. I was taught as a child that Jacob tricked him. In fact, I even just shared that same thing in our children's message. There was this trickery going on. And for many years, I believed this was true. By trickery, Jacob had taken what was Esau's by right. It's confirmed when Jacob and his mother make his hand in a later story rough and coarse as Esau's, and he goes in to meet his father and receive his father's blessing, rightfully, that's supposed to rightfully go to the firstborn. But I believe now that, actually, I don't think Esau was tricked. I think Esau didn't want his birthright. Think about it. His birthright came with the leadership of a nation. That sounds honorable and prestigious, but it also comes with burdens, encumbrances. He would have been responsible for feeding all of those sheep, feeding all of that household staff, thinking about how to take down all the tents and move them from place to place. The entire family business would have fallen on his shoulders. He would have had to understand administration, understand money and calculus of figuring out how to make all these different things happen, making sure that everyone, not just him, had a bowl of red stuff. It was work. And two, he would have inherited the history of his people. The actions of Abraham, the actions of Isaac, all of that would have come onto his shoulders. And some of us who have been reading about the stories of Abraham might wonder if we really want that heritage on our shoulders. Sometimes we might question some of those stories. We might ask that. The casting out of Hagar, the, the, uh, the use of Sarah to get into different places. Stories that we're telling about Jacob now. It was a staggering amount of responsibility. By trading it away, he was free. He had no responsibility. He didn't have to engage with other people. He didn't have to play politics. He never had to grow the family business. He could go out hunting, be his own man, and not be responsible. I think he thought he was happy trading it away, giving it to one who wanted it, so that he didn't have to bear responsibility. Yet once he did trade it away, and once his younger brother had received that blessing from his father, he was furious. The blessing that he received instead was inferior. It came with none of the power and prestige of the traditional firstborn's blessing. All that 
Esau's blessing, which we didn't read about in this reading, but all it came with was the ability to break the yoke of his brother, to not have to do what his younger brother would say. But that was it. And as he stood amongst the trappings of his birthright, I can imagine him standing there, free from all encumbrances, he also realized how much he did need it. He needed the people around him. He needed their support. He needed the flocks, even though they depended on him. He needed the tents, even though it was work. He needed the fruits of his birthright. But now he was rootless. And he saw this in the, saw in the stroke of a minute the price he had paid for shrugging, shrugging off his birthright. And he got really angry. Now, when we talk about birthright, your birthright is not necessarily just a material inheritance. It is rather the whole trappings of your family, the memories and actions that they have, that they and you have taken over generations, the good and the bad. It is creation, as Irish talked about, the air that we breathe, the land that we live in. That is part of our birthright, handed over to you by God clean and plentiful air, abundant food and water, a place to be shared and enjoyed. Your birthright is your ability to participate in the communal life around you. It's something given to you, something promised to you, something that you have. It is also the legacy of the past. It is poor decisions your parents made. It is poor decisions our great-great-grandparents made. It is slavery. It is silencing women. It is prioritizing materials over faith. It is Jim Crow. It's the lack of a national investment in the universal health care system where people are go funding themselves to try to get care. That is part of our birthright. It's a wholesale handing over of middle, middle class, working class jobs to overseas factories for cheaper made goods. It's also the union labor, the labor union who sat down on strikes to win weekends, just the ability to have weekends and to end child labor. It's the farmers who fought the Dust Bowl. It's the ones trying new practices to grow sustainable, chemical-free agriculture. But it's also those who use chemicals such as Roundup with abandon. It's decisions made about Native American reservations and expanding American imperialism following the Spanish-American War. It's decisions your ancestors made about where to live and who could live there and what actions to take. It's what you decide to do as a family now and how you care for one another and what you're handing down to the child or the children or to the people in the community around you. Those decisions reflect the health and nature of their birthright. It is overwhelming. It's overwhelming. When you put it all together in context, it is a lot. It is as constant, or it feels as constant, as Google's internet surveillance. And it is just as in inescapable. Our actions today are formed in part by the birthright we have received, flawed and beautiful as it can be. But our actions, too, impact the birthright we will pass on. That can be as personal as the birthright you hand to a child or, as clo or a close loved one. And it is as expansive as the birthright that you hand over to society and the world as a whole. The short answer is this. Your choices matter. Will you shrug it off? Part of our national sin is our love affair with what I will call Esau-ness. You see, you see the word there, Esau-ness? Yeah, I think so. We cherish and value the rugged individual who can carry everything by him or herself, master of her own fate with no dependence upon others. Such a person does not truly exist as Esau himself discovered. There are no roots. The plant never gains traction as Jesus taught. The seed itself gets snatched away never so much as to even send up a cotyledon, the early seeds, the first leaves coming out of the seed. There's no way to shrug off responsibility for everyone around oneself. Yet we insist that this is the ideal of freedom. We idealize it. 
It becomes the type of freedom that someone claims that they need not wear a mask in a time of a national pandemic. No responsibility for neighbor, no responsibility for birthright. It becomes the type of freedom that allows us to dump chemicals in the water with no concern for the fishing life of tomorrow or the watermen who care for it. It becomes the type of freedom that tells us that we don't actually have to figure out climate change, racism, or sexism. I'm tired of working on that. It becomes the type of freedom that allows us to shrug off the challenges of our own family, focusing on our own career or entertainment as if we are not all interconnected. That will shape the birthright of your community, your family. It is a staggering responsibility. Of course, with all the mistakes we've made and have been made before us, it is by God's grace alone that we are still alive. And I mean that. But still, with such responsibility pressing down upon us, it becomes clear that we may wish to choose not to take part in it. We might want to desperately opt for the bowl of stew, a meal, rather than engage with the responsibility that has been handed to us. We want to shrug off our own birthright, despise it even, to live as if there is no past that we have inherited, to live as if there is no past that has brought into us, to imagine, to pretend that there's some clean slate that we can step into as if this is the world that we have. It's all new, it's all fresh, but that's not the real world. For to follow through on the demands of our birthright, well, the fear that we have, I believe, is that it might impoverish us as we shift our money from that which is temporarily profitable to that which builds up society. It may call us to use our time to engage and participate in the political system, and not just as mere voters, but as the philosopher Sheldon Wolin calls it, originating or initiating cooperative action with others. It means trying when we no longer want to. Let me say that again. It means trying when we no longer want to. It means not selling our birthright, this country, this faith, your family, for something cheap and replaceable. Because a birthright is not replaceable. A bowl of stew is. Stuff is. Even selfishly used time is replaceable when compared to the birthright that you may want to walk away from. I'm going to tell you why I care about birthright. I struggled with this message today. I struggled with it. And it's a good thing that you know, we have stories of Jacob wrestling with God because Jacob, too, struggles with his birthright. But I... I struggle with birthright because I have a legacy that I want to leave to my son. And I can't change the entire world around me, but I also know that I can't insulate the world either. He's going to find out. No matter what I do, there's no way to hide that in there. So I have to recognize that what I do, what Irish does, what my family does, all of that is inherited on those tiny little shoulders. I want to leave him the legacy of a parent who so cared so deeply about his son's inheritance that I refused to do nothing about injustice, about racism, about climate change, about sexism, and more. I want to leave him a legacy that goes beyond activism or philanthropy and invites deep civic engagement, which is why I'm proud of my work in helping to found Anne Arundel Connecting Together, or ACT why I'm going to that workshop on Thursday, and I hope you will too. I want to leave him with an understanding of what a lived faith means, which is why this church matters so much to me. This is the place where my child encounters faith, encounters God, encounters the sacred stories, encounters the song, and it is painful that we can't gather in person to hear those stories, but we're doing the best we can and each night we close with a, with a book from the Jesus story, which is a collection of stories from the Bible that are written for children. Because 
I had those stories as a child in my non-church-going childhood, at least when I was younger. But I remember those stories. I want him to have those stories, and I want him to see a faith community that lives into those stories, that carries them with them, that takes them seriously, because that's what it means to be a child of God in this time and in this place, and to have hope, to have hope that his life has agency and purpose. I believe it comes and it's rooted in the soil of this church. And I say that specifically about here in this place. But I also want him to have a real and present father, which is why I have to give up time and all of those other things and the work that I do professionally and the work that I do in my own time and the work I do in the church to make time for him to throw a baseball, to build a sandbox, to find time to be with family, because that matters too. And we have to have that ability, that rest, that space, that Sabbath, that we can continue those connections with the people that we love and who love us. We don't, they don't have to be children, but you yourself, are called to figure out what those relationships are. What is the birthright that you are leaving? What is the legacy that you are handing down? What is your place and participation in it? Because this I know, each and every one of you is working hard on it. I know you are. I know that you are trying to figure out how to live this life, how to pass something on well, how to take care of yourself, but also how to take care of those you love whoever and wherever they may be. I know that we're working on all of those things because that is what it means to have a birthright. That is what it means to pass it down. We care deeply about that, and I know you do. So the question that this asks, the question that this story asks, the question of Jesus and the seeds asks, is what kind of soil are we putting forth for the people who come after us. We have inherited a birthright, a faith, a nation, a family. We have inherited all of that, and some of it is really messy, and some of it's not exactly what we want, and some of it's stuff that we really wish we could walk away from, but it's still there. And we still have to grow in it. But we have, by the grace of God, been blessed to be called into a place together in places of family and places of church and places of community to roll up our sleeves and to do the real work of creating a space for the community around us, of creating a space for the people around us, of creating a space for ourselves too. And I believe that this is what birthright means. I believe this is what we've been charged with. I believe this is how we create a place where plants can grow, where the generations that come after us can grow to give forth good fruit. And that gives me so much hope, even in this moment, even as bad as the news may be, and as our Bible study can tell you, even as dark as Ezekiel chapter 7 can make it look, we are blessed by God to be together, to work on this together, to have hope, and to have the agency and the ability to make changes here, there, and everywhere. Thanks be to God. Amen. We now come to a time of giving. The church has been a worker for justice, peace, and healing since its foundational start at the lynching of Jesus Christ by those who had dominant power. It has also been a place of resurrection, a refuge, a place of prayer, reflection, and support amidst the turbulence of our own lives. The work of the church is sustained by your prayer, your fellowship, and your giving of time and money. We thank you for all the ways you give and invite you to give now to keep the work going.
Lord, Lord, open unto me. Open unto me light for my darkness. unto me joy for my sorrow. Open unto me strength for my weakness. Open unto me wisdom for my confusion. Open unto me forgiveness for my sins. Open unto me tenderness for my toughness. Open unto me love for my hates. Open unto me Thyself for myself. Lord, Lord, open unto me. People of God, we come now. We come now and we gather before God with thanksgiving for the ability to give, for the ability to give of ourselves, the, for the ability to act, the ability to love, and the ability to share. Oh God, bless what we are able to give in our prayers, in our work, in our love, in our care, both for ourselves, for the people we love, and the community around us. All of this we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. And friends, we now turn in prayer to the prayers that we bring into this place. Prayers of hope, prayers of joy, prayers of sadness, sorrow, and longing as well. We invite you to, to write these prayers here in the... Um, let's see here. We invite you to write these prayers here in the chat box, uh, if you're able to, any prayers that you want to share, and I'll repeat them and share them out uh, and we can all say, God, in your mercy, hear our prayers. God, in your grace, hear our prayers. Or as is so often the case, God, in your grace and mercy, 
hear our prayers. I offer up a prayer for one of our members who um, was hospitalized last week but is uh, back home and is healing. Um, We pray for him and for his continued um, healing and for uh, family being around him. God, in your mercy and grace, hear our prayers. A prayer lifted up by Sandy, prayers for our nation, the rule of law, and the health experts who continue to speak truth about the virus and the implications for our country and her people. Sandy, we pray with you for for all of those things. God, in your mercy, hear our prayers. We pray as well for, for this church, for the work that we are called into in this moment. This morning, we talked during our Bible study, we talked a lot about vision and about trying to capture a vision and recognizing that that's not always the way to do things, that maybe there was a vision that we've had. And so part of the idea was looking to recapture a vision. And so I offer up a prayer for this congregation that we see the vision that God has given to us, that we go back to that and we see how we can continue to live into that, to be the people of God in this time and in this place, and to continue to call ourselves to account and to do the work of loving one another and the people around us. God, in your mercy, hear our prayers. Prayer as well comes into the chat room um, from Kathy McFadden. Prayers from my mom who lives in Texas. Um, who lives in Texas and to, um, she is looking to see her test to see if she has COVID-19 She's feeling better, but she's feeling nervous. So Kathy, are you saying she had it? So she did not, but she has not been well, and so she's continuing to to heal. Kathy, we pray for your your mom. God, in your mercy, hear our prayers. And uh, prayer from Rick as well. Prayers for all people that cannot get relief from the hot weather. God, we pray for all those who are suffering from the heat right now. We know that warming centers are being opened up around the county, so we pray for them. God, in your mercy, or cooling center, sorry. God, in your mercy, hear our prayers. We pray as well for those who are lining up still to receive food across this county through the efforts of Feed Anne Arundel, which was the focus of our mission for two months of 10% of our collections went to, these, went to this for totaling an excess of $7,000 we were able to support efforts to feed, and $7,000 would feed about 70, 700 people, 700 people. Um, so the idea of being able to feed 700 people in the midst of lines where we know that thousands are being fed, one of the pantries that we helped to launch through Feed and Arundel at Tyler Heights Elementary celebrated or marked 15,000 people served in the course of three months. We recognize that the needs are strong that there is a lot of work to do. God, bless the work of those who are on the front lines. Bless those of us who are called to help, that we may be sustained and able to continue to do the ministries which you call us to. God, in your grace, hear our prayers. We pray as well from a, a prayer from Laura for prayers of relief from anxiety and for renewed motivation. Laura, God, in your mercy, hear our prayers. Prayers from John, prayers for safe travel. Uh, as his son Mark drives this week from Denver to Annapolis, and as he drives with him to New York City to start a new job. John, we pray for your travel, and we pray for the travel of your son. God, in your mercy, hear our prayers. Prayers from Hildy for our emotional health, for courage and hope of relief. God, in your mercy, hear our prayers. And prayers from Irish for a high school friend whose young son has leukemia. We pray for his healing in this time. God, in your mercy, hear our prayers. People of God, for all these prayers that we have shared, prayers we have spoken and prayers we have not, prayers that we have held to our hearts, but prayers that are nonetheless being carried by us. God, in your grace and mercy, hear these prayers. And let us close with a prayer for peace which is printed in our bulletin. O loving God, spirit of hope and peace, lead us from death to life. Lead us from falsehood to truth. Lead us from despair to hope, from fear to trust. Lead us from hate to love, from war to peace. Let peace fill our hearts, 
our world, our universe. Peace, peace, peace. People of God, go from this place. Maybe it's just going from one room to another. Maybe it's going out into the backyard. Maybe it's going onto the street in front of the house. But wherever it is and wherever you journey, in this time and in this place, go forth from this place and know that God loves you. Go forth from this place and know that no matter what has been placed upon your shoulders, what responsibilities you have been called to bear, that you can bear them, that the people of God are here with you, to bear them with you, that we are challenged one another to carry that yoke with you and to not shrug off the birthright which we have received, but also to know that justice is with us, that love is with us, that we are called to do this one with another so that there is good soil, so that the seeds may sprout and hope may reign abundant so that love may win. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the companionship of the Holy Spirit be with us all evermore. Amen. Amen. Friends, as we go from this place, we invite you to join us for the coffee hour. Begins.